Hey everybody, happy Chinese New Year. Welcome to the 12 Step Buddhist Podcast, episode number 8. We're going to talk about acupuncture today and its benefit in the uh, treatment of addiction. And visiting with us uh, from Phoenix Acupuncture and Chinese Medicine Clinic here in Forest Grove, Oregon, is my friend uh, Jane Birch uh, Pesis. Pesis. Say your last name, please. Birch Pesis. Birch Pesis. Sorry about that. I'm, I'm a klutz. Um, you can find out about Jane's work at um, the following website, phoenix-acupuncture.net. And that'll be posted up on the uh, website and blog. So, Jane, thanks so much for coming today. You're welcome. We got a little bit settled here getting the podcast um, interview tactics in order and are about to discuss a little bit about the history of treating addiction with acupuncture. So uh, you were saying a little bit before the interview about the initial treatments uh, with heroin addicts. Right, because it was developed about 30 years ago. And, you know, uh, substance addiction in the United States goes through fads. <laughs> and at that time, the issue was uh, heroin was the big, scary drug. And uh, it was heroin addiction uh, in the ghetto in New York. And people were trying to, to figure out ways to deal with that. And what, um, what type of treatment was done and what were the results that were found? Well, it was an interesting interaction. Uh, there was a, a French physician who encountered someone in uh, China doing some ear acupuncture points, and he developed that even more. And then it was developed even more sort of on the ground. And so there was a five-needle protocol that came about, which means five needles in each ear, and that's known as the 5NP or the five-needle protocol for addiction. And it's very powerful in treating virtually every form of addiction. Now, what are the uh, measurable results of using acupuncture to treat addiction? Yeah, that's really the hard part. It's very difficult to measure results, especially when you're dealing with a, co a topic as complex as addiction, because, you know, there's, uh, you know, most people will tell you if you're going to kick a habit, any habit, you have to make the attempt more than once. Yes, definitely. So, you know, if, if somebody kicks the habit with the help of acupuncture and then they relapse later, then is that a failure of treatment or is it a success of treatment? You know, there's no magical number for each substance or each individual how many times they need to relapse before they finally kick it for sure. And, of course, there are some cases of people who uh, I hear occasionally in the case of uh, tobacco. They kick it once, that's it. But that's not the average person. No, actually, what I found in writing my book is that in, especially in, in the government treatment programs, um, just the fact that addiction is a brain disease, and in any disease, uh, relapse is part of the treatment process. And it's difficult, you know, being in the 12 step community because for us, um, success means total abstinence. And we have a difficult time in the 12 step community coping with each other's relapses, and probably right. because it's so painful. I have a friend who just relapsed on crack and, and heroin wow. um, and beer yesterday, somebody Ouch. I care about a lot. And, you know, it's work for me to be non-judgmental about that because I don't want him to use. I want him to be happy. So the way I define abs or the way I define success in, in recovery is through abstinence. But um, also there's another thing that we call being happy in your own skin in, in the recovery uh, community. So maybe there are other ways. Would you think there would be other ways to um, determine uh, any measure of success for using acupuncture uh, besides using the you know, number of days or months of complete abstinence? How else would you know it's working? Right. Well, what's used most commonly, and of course there are clinical trials, which are mostly right now because they're trying to do them after a Western model of disaster, but what they're using in clinics, the reason that it's done in thousands of clinics across the country is that they're using uh, adherence to their program. So, you know, acupuncture should not be used as the only treatment in the sure. treatment of addiction. So when you have people that are trying to kick a habit, then they need to go to a certain amount of counseling certain yes. sessions a week. Yeah. And so what they find is when they include acupuncture among those kinds of treatments mm -hmm. that... Uh, a higher percentage of people complete the program. Sure, yeah. And so that's how they're using their measures of success. No, that makes a lot of sense, and we call that multivariate analysis in psychology research. 
you know, it's really impossible to uh, 100% uh, tease out all the variables that contribute to one, you know, causative uh, or that are that are the cause of one effect, say the effect being abstinence or some other measure. So I'm with you 100% on that. Um, when a, when acupuncture is added into a comprehensive treatment strategy, it's found that that variable acupuncture um, is a contributing factor to longer term recovery. Maybe right. other other measures of health, happiness. Do they do that kind of right. testing on there? I just brought one. I, you know, I have a whole flock of research, sure, but sure. I just brought one with me today, and this is from Canada. Okay. And it's interesting because they looked at other things. You know, there there are often things that are pushing the addiction, like uh, emotional problems and stuff like that. And they did pre-test and post-test okay. on depression, anxiety, and stress scale. Okay. And they had much lower uh, numbers after that. And on both all three, depression, anxiety, and stress. Yeah. And that Big helps parts people of addiction. Yeah. Yeah, stay in a program. Yeah, and it helps people stay. Yeah, because when you get hopeless, you feel like, you know, there's no way out, and, and why bother, you know? So let's take a step back um, to just kind of give us some broad stroke general principles of how, what is acupuncture for the person who's never, you know, uh, heard of it, and just kind of in general, how does it work? Um, maybe just a little bit of the, of the history of how it's come into the U.S., that sort of thing, if you have any thoughts Sure, I'd love to talk about that. Okay. Um, well, acupuncture involves putting very fine needles into specific points in the skin. Those points are located along meridians, and meridians are places where the chi flows through the body, and your chi is your life energy. I see. And uh, as long as you're alive, it's flowing through your, your body. And uh, you're putting... Uh, needles in those points to adjust the flow of the chi in your body. For example, uh, if you have pain, it's usually chi stagnation. And acupuncture is very powerful for the treatment of pain. Uh, and it, it, you know, there, there are thousands of diagnoses and then there are Chinese diagnoses. But um, all these kinds of things can be very helpful. And the five-needle protocol for addiction is just a very balancing treatment. And, you know, with, with addiction, you're basically poisoning yourself in order to get the high, to get the side effect of the poison. And so you have to walk that fine line of poisoning yourself enough to get the high and not so much that you kill yourself. And so acupuncture... It's difficult to be one's own psychiatrist. Yes. So acupuncture pulls people back in balance when they've been throwing themselves out of balance, out of balance, out of balance for years. And of course... You know, there was, there's also the issue of the initial injury that causes them to seek out a substance because they're so far out of balance. They're feeling so much pain they can't deal with it, and so they feel like they need that substance. So the National Acupuncture Detoxification Associate, Association, their acronym is NADA, and people laugh about that. They say, oh, NADA means nothing. And we say, yes, that's the point. There's nothing on the needles. There's nothing in the needles. So when people who've been depending on substances to get them through their life, through their day, uh, they, you put some needles in them, there's nothing on the needle, there's nothing in the needle, and they feel more in balance, they feel more grounded, they feel more stable, less anxious, you know, whatever they feel as a result of that treatment, and of course it'll vary from person to person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a powerful message, it's what's inside them that is bringing them into balance. Mm -hmm. You're just nudging it back into position with the needles. So the needle actually redirects the energy on those chi meridians or blocks the energy how does that work mostly unblocking it unblocks it right it gets so, stuck or stagnant and it can redirect it in some cases yes okay that's very interesting well i know that in tibetan medicine there are similar theories about how disease functions in the body as part of a blocking or uh, misdirection of energy right and i happen to know a guy who's trained in tibetan uh, traditional medicine mm -hmm. And uh, he says that the issues are very similar. But he also says, <laughs> we always get complaints about how the herbs taste. And he says, boy, Tibetan herbs are even worse. They're terrible. <laughs> well, I've got a jar of Tibetan herbs. I've been trying to get them refilled. Maybe I should hook up with your friend and, uh, and find my prescription on there. Well, I, um, I've had a little bit of uh, acupuncture in the past. I had about 18 months of acupuncture and acupressure. A bunch with a bunch of other treatments for carpal tunnel. I had pretty serious carpal tunnel for a while. My hands and fingers were numb. And I found, I'm not positive how the needles worked, but I do know that there was a really direct impact of the pressure point therapy 
right. some of the what's that one called where they use suction cups to pull the cupping cupping and you get big purple bruises right. all, all over <laughs> We make jokes about that. It's like you've been making love to an octopus. Yeah, and and that, um, and, and also the um, t- like kind of taping seeds into the ear Absolutely. and that sort of thing. So um, I was just willing to try anything because I was so desperate with the with the the uh, numbness and so forth. So I always uh, that, that really opened my mind. Like I said, I don't know which one it was, but I tried everything. Right. And we'd use my my old uh, sponsor used to call the barn door barn wall approach. You just fire at the barn wall, and you know you're going to hit something. Right. So uh, I think that that's a pretty interesting um, uh, way to go. But uh, I would like to uh, find out a little bit more about the the costs and the duration of treatment. Um, is acupuncture expensive, or how long, how long do people need to do it for? Um, right. I would say that compared to other forms of medical treatment, acupuncture is actually pretty cheap. But, you know, the fact is that people are not used to paying for medical treatment. You either have insurance or you go without medical treatment. Right. So whenever you're confronted with the cost of medical treatment, then, you know, people are always kind of astounded and staggered. Uh, so the how much the individual acupuncturist costs depends on a lot of variables. And, you know, we're not even encouraged to talk to each other about how much we cost because then it's like price fixing or Mm -hmm. something you know people get nervous about that so how much you charge it depends on how much rent you're paying are you in a high rent district or a low rent district you know and uh, various things like that and then how much you charge and how much you actually get paid if the person has insurance that's a whole other question but uh, actually sorry i just realized that question is not relevant to this because i don't know of any insurance company that will pay for acupuncture treatment for addiction yeah that's uh that was going to be my next question uh, this is the kind of thing that we run into when when we when we run into a brick wall with um with western methods um and we're trying desperately to find some solutions or if we're simply just curious and following up we have a friend who's tried something uh that may be uh, considered a little bit more esoteric even fringed by Western uh, uh, medical or, uh, standards, then how do we how do we pay for it? How do I find you know? I'll, I will say that my uh, and my acupuncturist down in Santa Cruz actually didn't. He charged me to a certain point, and then there was like a couple thousand dollars left over that he. I told him send me the bill and I'll make payment arrangement. He never billed me, yeah. and I thought maybe. I thought he was either very unorganized or he was just trying to be a spiritual practitioner in a way and to try to give. You know, I don't know what the deal was, but uh, it was a, it was definitely different than the the regular doctor who would definitely be knocking on your door. Right. Um, not to say that services should be free, but it's just right. interesting different models. How how would I find? Say I'm in uh, Kansas or uh, Miami or or someplace that doesn't have a lot of real uh, different types of uh, maybe maybe a little bit more traditional or conservative areas and so forth. Um, how would I go about finding? an acupuncturist to to treat addiction? Well, there's a couple of issues. And one is, uh, how do you find an acupuncturist? And I would, my recommendation would be that you go to www.nccaom.org because they're the ones that administer the national exam. The national exam is required for state licensing in every state except California. So if you're not in California, you can find, you enter your zip code, you can find an acupuncturist that way. Oh, nice. Way. Okay. The other issue is to find out whether your state allows uh, acupuncture detox specialists to needle people. Oh. These are basically lay people. They've gone to a week of training to learn the five needle protocol. That's it. They are oh, not. Really? Yes. They're oh. not acupuncturists. And that's generally going to be cheaper than going to an acupuncturist. But wow. you're going to get the five needle protocol sure. and that's it. Whereas if you happen to go in and you're... You're trying to detox, and you also have a headache that day or a backache. The acupuncture is going to treat what they see. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So those are those are two issues right there. Um, the other thing is, uh, and I guess this might not be true everywhere, but certainly in the Portland metro area, I would say assume that you can get acupuncture. Mm-hmm. There are um, Central City Concern has a recovery program. And at the Correctional Center in Hillsboro, there's a public health acupuncture clinic so that you can get acupuncture there for free. Wow. It's okay. no frills acupuncture. Mm-hmm. You know, you're sitting in a chair. But these are circle. licensed people. Then. They are licensed people, mm-hmm. yes. Mm-hmm. So it is acupuncture. And um, 
if you if you don't want to go that route, if you don't want to go down to the correctional center and six, next to somebody who hasn't bathed that day or whatever, then uh, talk to you know look around and talk to the acupuncturist in your area. Mm-hmm. For for me, um, and I say this on my website, you know, uh, when you're in the initial withdrawal phase, you may need acupuncture every day. If you're coming to me. You know, and you don't have a lot of money, I may give you a deal f- to pay by the week instead sure. of by the treatment, you know, just so that you can get the treatment that you need. And of course, some acupuncturists are going to feel stronger about treating addiction than others. You know, I've got the training, I'm an ADS in addition to being a- an acupuncturist. And what's an ADS? Uh, Acutetox specialist. Oh, I see. Okay. And tell us a little bit about that training. Well, most people that are not acupuncturists go to a one week training that's put on by NADA. And they they get a certificate. They have they're certified as an acu detox specialist. And if you're like me, it happened while I was going through acupuncture school. They just want to be sure that you have done a certain amount of acupuncture treatment in what we would consider a public health venue. So because that's the venue, you know, people that have no money, they have an addiction problem, they don't have a job, that kind of thing. They may be homeless. Um, then, you know, it's a public health venue they're going to go to. They're not going to go to private practitioners. They don't have the money. They can't swing it. But if you if you have a job, if you haven't, like, bottomed out, then uh, and you feel the need of acupuncture, then, you know, look around, talk to the people in your area, tell them your situation. At the very least, almost any acupuncturist would be able to give you, like, a payment plan. Sure, Most of them sure. are willing to do a payment plan. If I think, you know, just thinking back to the 70s, um, when I first heard of acupuncture I think there are a lot of people maybe offering to cure your cigarette smoking for example right. and, that, and, that, and that sort of thing and <laughs> maybe that wasn't the best way to um, introduce people to the idea because you know we know that you can't really make these kind of promises but if we understand this kind of again an, a comprehensive overall treatment program um, for example one uh, treatment for quitting smoking is to use uh, Wellbuterin, which is an antidepressant. And I remember asking my doctor about Wellbuterin, and I said, how does that function to um, alleviate is it the withdrawal symptoms or what? And he said, really, no, it's the depression associated with w- withdrawal. Right. So people find that they can't stay quit because they're so depressed, they give up. And right. the Wellbuterin reduces the depression, and then they can function and cope within the rest of their treatment program. So I think that you're talking about a- using acupuncture in much the same way. Um, to deal with the emotions of it. As part of, yeah, as part of the overall and dealing with the depression and the anxiety associated. Well, in the beginning, in mm-hmm. what I call the withdrawal stage, when mm-hmm. you're in the withdrawal stage, it will knock down cravings considerably. I see. So that's why I think of it as two separate stages. You mm-hmm. know, that first three or four weeks, usually depending on the substance mm-hmm. where you're trying to get the initial physiological withdrawal taken care of, it can knock down cravings. It's not going to eliminate them entirely. Sure. For some people it will. For other people it doesn't. It barely and when you say cravings, uh, what's the spectrum of substances that you're familiar with? Um, you know, nicotine, opiates, m- marijuana, alcohol. Right. Or is there a difference between the different types? You mean in the degree to which it knocks down cravings? Yeah. No, it's more a difference from varying from individual to individual. Mm-hmm. Because in speaking with the neurologist on, on the last, I think it was the last podcast, uh, Dr. Sarah Ulrich, we're talking about sex addiction as a um, process of kind of a dopamine process, dopamine craving enhancement, you know, right. you know, in the brain. Whereas the brain doesn't really know the difference if it's getting a shot of heroin or if it's participating in an actual process of you know uh, preparing to uh, engage in the addiction and what have you. Right. So. Are you familiar with that type of uh, science, and does acupuncture lend any um, help in that area in reducing that kind of dopamine addiction response? Mm, Yes, it does, and I I am familiar in general with the Western approach to neurotransmitter analysis Mm -hmm. of addiction, but it's not something I deal with every day. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't say, you know, at what you know, when I put the needle in, what is it doing? We do know, you know, there have I have read studies where, you know, they needle people, they, they take a blood test before needling, and then they needle people and take a blood test after, and endorphins are increased by acupuncture treatment. But 
you know, when you, the, we still haven't figured out from a Western standpoint how acupuncture works. We know very well from a Chinese standpoint, but mm-hmm. not from a Western standpoint. So if you say, well, acupuncture increases uh, endorphins in the bloodstream, then people think it's only for treatment of pain. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't explain how it treats irritable bowel syndrome or PTSD or, you know, other things like that. So I get a little nervous when people say, well, can you translate that into neurotransmitters? Mm-hmm. It's like... Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd love to, but we don't know all that yet. <laughs> right. So just in terms of um, being able to treat the cravings for different types of addictions, I guess, was where I was really starting with that question. You're, right. pretty, you're pretty confident that, the, say, the five-needle process in the, in the withdrawal stage, at least, will reduce cravings for most type of addictions, be they substances, processes, events, right. or is there some variability there? Right. Well, as I said, I think the variability is between individuals. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I had a, a guy who was, was trying to quit smoking. He would come into my office. He'd be dying for a cigarette. He'd leave my office. He had no desire for a cigarette. Mm-hmm. And that would last for him for about 24 hours. So how much it reduces your cravings and for how long is going to depend on things like your biochemistry, how long you've been abusing, how you know how how strong your dose was when you were abusing. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a lot of variables there, but most people should expect that it will at least reduce their cravings and help them be more calm and centered. And, yeah, I think that that's kind of, that was one of the things that I learned about psychotropic medication was that, you know, I had a lot of anxiety, and um, I guess they call it social anxiety now, but just a lot of high stress and, and, and sort of locking up emotionally. And I read this article in an ad in some you know, doctor's office magazine about how the um, drug teaches your brain that it doesn't have to be in that state all the time. And with therapy, you are learning what to do to increase, you know, the, the, the duration and the, the, you know, the effectiveness of that state. In other okay. words, we give ourselves, we give our addict brain a little bit of a break but then we've got to, whether it's with therapy, psychotropic medications, um, other tor- other forms of treatment, acupuncture, et cetera, when, we get, when we're giving ourselves that break, we need to um, operate wisely in that time frame right. to build up the confidence and to learn the tools to sort of retrain ourselves in right. a way. Would you, would you agree with that thinking? Yeah, and, you know, I've been listening to a, a CD by John Kabat-Zinn, mm-hmm. so to take it over into Buddhist mm-hmm. thinking, you know, suffering is inevitable, and it's how you deal with the suffering. Mm-hmm. So the people who start to abuse at a certain age, they mature according to how they deal with their suffering. And if you start, that's what's frightening about children abusing. If you start abusing at age 12, you you can abuse for 10 years. The minute you quit abusing, you have the emotional maturity of a 12-year-old. Correct. Because you've not learned the lessons that pain can teach you. Yeah, we, uh, we deal with a lot of people in the recovery world like that. It's an interesting thing, and I try to approach this in my book as well, because if you don't know that when you're dealing with an addict, it's very difficult to have patience and compassion. You're just right. wondering, why are they acting like a 12-year-old? Right. <laughs> because the brain stopped there on some level. Right. You know, we have to deal in that, but it's complex. It's not, it's not all that person may be really highly functional as an attorney or something in the courtroom, but right. in their relationship at home, they may be acting like a 12 year old. Right. So it's a little bit of a, of a complex scenario, but, um, I think it's all very interesting. And I think that we can grow on these different planes. Um, if we, if we learn how to function within that sober time frame, right? If you just stop the drug and, or alcohol or whatever, and don't, insert some sort of treatment, I right. think it, it's uh, almost impossible to function. Right. They may transfer. Transfer I'm, to another addiction. Yeah. Right. I'm the adult child of an alcoholic. Mm-hmm. My father did an interesting transfer when I was in second grade from mm-hmm. alcohol to religion. Mm. So yeah, it was a fundamentalist religion, so mm-hmm. it worked for him. Yeah. I, um, I, I started writing about that in my book originally, a little bit about the sort of the mentality of religiosity, but I decided to back away from it. Um, but I do understand what you're talking about. I know that in the DSM they do classify as, it's called religiosity. When people become extremely obsessed with their religion, um, but I haven't thought about it in a while in terms of it being um, an alternate type of addiction. But 
that's probably the subject of another podcast that we could get into. I'm sure a long-term discussion on that. Um, before we close up, this has been pretty interesting for me. And before we close up, um, we've got a couple more minutes. What else would you like people to know? Uh, any other thoughts that you have that we didn't cover that um, you, you think might be interesting to our podcast audience? Just that, you know, it can help. There is no cure for addiction. It's not a cure. It should not be depended on by itself to treat your addiction. Uh, and if you think you would benefit from it, you can find it. You, it may take some work, but it's out there. You can get it if you think it will benefit from it. Yeah, I, I have to attest to that. I mean, because when I was trying to find some, some counseling, um, I went through tons of different people. I would interview them as a consumer. Like, I think it's... Scott Peck says in his book, The Road Less Traveled, that you have to treat this kind of thing as a consumer. Instead of walking into someone's office and saying, okay, I demand that you fix me, <laughs> you know, you have to be able to walk in there and say, what, how can we work together in a team approach to help you help me, you know, and uh, if it's not mm, working, People will on. faint when you do that. <laughs> yeah, well, we have to revolutionize our thinking on a lot of levels. Yeah. Well, everybody, thanks so much for tuning in and listening. This has been another episode of the 12-Step Buddhist Podcast. We're going to have uh, Jane's information up on the website for you to find out. I'm, I'm certain that you're available to answer some questions and help people. Um, also, uh, Jane attended my um, Internet marketing class and is now on Twitter. So we'll have her Twitter link. Um, up there so you can follow her and, and get updates and that sort of thing and she has a blog I looked at your website it's looking sharp you've got some articles up there actually on addiction I did right. take a look at that so I think we're looking pretty good um, everybody Jane thank you so much thank you I hope to talk to you again